My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man has contributed immensely to coaching here in Australia. None other than the great Ian Greener. Welcome, Ian, to this conversation. Thanks, Sash. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Brilliant. So tell us, Ian, how did you fall in love with our great game? Oh, I guess because a kid growing up in the northeast of England, you fall in love as soon as you can walk and run around and kick a ball. So, so I guess I was just like every other young kid back in England. You just wanted to to to, to play football. We played football in the sum, in the winter, cricket in the summer, but you also played soccer in the summer as well, or football as we called it. So, yeah, I just grew up with with a ball, encouraged by my dad and my brother. We used to play in the back garden and go down the the sports fields, play with your mates, play at school, play in wintertime, play in snow, play in heat, play in any conditions. You go out in the morning and you get called called by your mum at six or seven o'clock at night to come in and have your dinner. So really? it was just soccer all the time. And so, so you talk about that love for unorganised play. Um, when did you start uh, being involved in organised sport? Did you play for your school or a club? Well, I played uh, for the school and then uh, because I was in, in the northeast, uh, Newcastle came came knocking on the door when I was uh, probably about 10 or 11. Used to go training there once a week on a Thursday night, which which was you know great for a young kid playing for your local team or at least be, being trained there. So I had 12 months there. Uh, they didn't take up the option. So I just continued to play for the school. Continue to play around for the for the uh, district. Um, grew up with with uh, Brian Robson, who went on to play. Wow. Obviously, have a quite quite a big career. So uh, Brian and I, we went to, to uh, different schools, but we used to catch up at night times, weekends, kick the ball around. Um, I guess 13, 14, a few more clubs started to take a bit of an interest. Chelsea, Crystal Palace, they used to uh, take me into London. During the school holidays, which was great again for just a young kid, I'd take us down for a week, stay at the club hotel, um, just great times. And then Chelsea, when I was 15, Chelsea wanted to sign as a, as a schoolboy. But uh, my mum and dad at the time thought that it was best to stay on at school. So probably at the time, I, I wasn't particularly happy with my mum and dad. But uh, looking back, it was the best uh, decision. Uh, Chelsea said that they would come back when I finished year 10 at school. Um, they didn't. So you, you just keep on playing, keep on loving the game. And then uh, Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough actually stepped in and offered, a, uh, offered me an apprenticeship. So I left school uh, when I was 16 and signed at Middlesbrough. Uh, the, the manager at the time was a guy called Stan Anderson who was a, a real a hero in the northeast of England, played for Newcastle, Sunderland, Middlesbrough, played for England, and Stan signed as, as an apprentice, uh, I think I remember the 2nd of October, 1972. So that's when it all started from a professional point of view. Where, where did you gravitate onto the pitch, uh, Ian? In what way? Sorry? How, so in, in terms of your position, so where, where oh, did you play? I started off as a, uh, actually... <laughs> In the early days, I was a goalkeeper, but but I was no good. So I, I got kicked out of being a goalkeeper. Uh, I, I was a winger. I loved to dribble, take on players. And so they, uh, Middlesbrough, well, the Chelsea and uh, Crystal Palace looked at as, as a striker, as a winger, goal scorer. Um, so that's why I signed at Middlesbrough as a winger. Stan, unfortunately, after about three months, Stan got the sack uh, as football managers come and go. Uh, we had the uh, ex-England assistant manager, Harold Shepperton, who was also assistant manager at uh, Middlesbrough. Uh, Harold took over for a few months and then uh, the club signed Jack Charlton. So okay. Jack, Jack came in as his first uh, professional gig. Jack, Jack had just finished playing at Leeds United and Jack came in as a, uh, as a new manager and signed me as a professional. So I'd finished my apprenticeship. Jack signed as, as an apprentice, as a professional. Jack Charlton wasn't really keen on wingers, so I guess I developed into a midfield player. Okay. All right. So um, do you remember what your first contract, how much that, how many uh, pounds or? £7.43 a week. 
And what was the average wage uh, going back? Like if you had well, that, that was an apprentice wage. Uh, so on seven pound forty three, I uh, had to pay board. I had to. Okay. I was in the process of buying a car and running a car uh, and buying clothes as well and records. So seven pound forty three a week doesn't sound much, but it, but back in nineteen seventy two, you managed to, to 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 survive. So it was oh good. It was good. And my first professional contract was <laughs> jumped up to £25 a week, plus bonuses, plus bonuses. And who were who some of the notable players at the time around the club that you oh. sort of, you looked well, up I to played, and said, wow, I'm in the same dressing room as that bloke? I played for the for the youth team on a Saturday, but, but the big thrill was playing for the reserves midweek. Uh, so you played with players like uh, Nobby Styles. Nobby was just coming to, to the end of his career, obviously one of the World Cup winners. Nobby was just an incredible player in the dressing room, but just such a supporter of young players. Uh, so uh, when you played for the reserves and Nobby was playing there, he, he was just terrific. He was really good. Can actually, as a bit of an aside, I used to babysit his kids on certain nights. So it was a great way of getting out of the club hostel because you were kind of locked in there to a certain extent. So to go and stay at, at somebody's house and in those days, a nice house with a big colour TV and looking yeah. after kids who were sleeping upstairs, it was, yeah, it was a joy. So uh, Nobby was a great experience. And then Middlesbrough signed a guy called Bobby Murdoch, who had a legendary career at Celtic. And Bobby was just, again, one of those incredible characters who just looked after the young kids. Uh, Bobby was coming to the end of his career and played a couple of reserve games with Bobby as well. And also uh, Middlesbrough signed Graham Sooners. And Graham, oh, wow. was, Graham was in the, actually, he stayed with us in the club hostel for about six months after he'd come from Tottenham. Graham was uh, struggling at that time. He, he couldn't even get into the reserves at that stage. And somewhere I've got programs of my name on the team sheet and Graham soon as, on, as the sub. So that's, he, he struggled a bit when he first came to Middlesbrough. Uh, but then Jack Charlton, so, Ian, Jack Charlton the, really. In the, 70, in the early 70s, Ian, there was, was there only one on the bench at that time? Yep. So, yep. yeah. Just one. So to get in the first 11, it's like, like really difficult. You name the sub as one. You only yeah. go on if there's somebody really gets hurt. That's right. Yeah, football's played a whole 90 minutes. Everybody plays. Rarely is a, a substitution made for tactical uh, reasons, purely most of the time for, due to injury. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so really tough to break into the fir first team. Oh, it was. But but the uh, thrill of being a youth player on the weekend and then when the when the team sheet went up on the Tuesday morning for the, for the reserve game, you know, and it wasn't... It, it, there wasn't non-glorious places like Barnsley and Scunthorpe and Halifax, and but it was midweek and in winter time it was freezing, snow, rain. It was tough going, but it was just an incredible experience. And another player was Eric McMordy, who played for Northern Ireland, and Eric was George Best's mate when they went over to Manchester at fifteen. George stayed. Eric got homesick, went back to Belfast. But Eric went on to have a great career with, with Northern Ireland. And Eric, again, was coming to the end of his career. But he was just another guy that just looked after the young kids. And I think that's, we'll probably get onto it later. But, but one of the faults of today's programme is that we don't have reserve teams where experienced coaches are helping young kids develop through the games. And they were just fantastic, not only during the games, but in the dressing room, around the club, just, just giving you pointers about how to be a professional footballer. So um, talk to me. So did you end up, so you obviously you, you're signing as apprentice, being in the youth and reserve at the highest level. Um, walk us through then your, 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 your playing career. Where did, where did you move on to? Well, I, I was there for uh, three and a half years. Uh, it was going really well. Finished up as the top scorer in the youth team. Scored scored goals for the reserves. Actually, one game against Doncaster, I managed to score four. So I was doing really well at 16. And then I copped a pretty bad injury at Barnsley. Again, you remember dates, 13th of December, 1972. Um, I was a 16-year-old, thought I was invincible, thought I was... 
Maradona or Pele and maybe some of the senior pros at Barnsley that night didn't really take kindly to uh, getting beat by a little kid of 16. So I finished up in the first row of the grandstand, mm. had my knee uh, dislocated, uh, mm. uh, put me out for about three or four months. We came back. I was top goal scorer again in the youth side the following year. Had a couple of stints with the first team. They actually took us away. To, again, because there only 12 players in the team, 11 and one sub, Jack, Jack's view was to take a young player away and give them that experience of being 13th man. And the 13th man was always in charge of the skip, getting the gear into the, in, into the rooms, <laughs> being the sort of uh, dog's body, but getting yeah. it, the experience of being yeah. close to the team. And, and should anybody go sick on the bus journey or the overnight stay, but uh, the 13th man, I was at Blackpool for a league game, which was great experience. But then I was 13th man at, at, at uh, Man United in the League Cup. Oh, cool. And that was just an incredible experience sitting on the bench uh, at a League Cup game. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And and so the, it's interesting, like you're, you're, you're 16 and, and being that 13th man, you think about squads now or size and, and sometimes in some squads it, at, the, at professional level, you don't have a 16-year-old sitting on the bench. You know, it's 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 interesting uh, how that has shifted in uh, in fifty years of football. Um, but we had thirty four players, so at the club, the uh, changing room, it had thirty four players. So that was the first team that the reserves and youth squad. Okay, all right. So uh, and you got to mix with all thirty four players. Oh yeah, that. everybody got changed in the one one changing area, um, and it was just. We used to play play cricket in the in the changing rooms, which Gra- Graham Sooners uh, was not a cricket a cricket fan, so he used to throw the the uh, cricket bat away and the ball. He didn't want people playing cricket because he didn't like it. Mm. And there was just a lot of banter going on. Typical typical changing room banter with with players, players having their clothes taken away, uh, people nicking their car keys, moving their cars. So so when you went out after training, you didn't know where your car was. Just a lot of banter going on that we sometimes lose some of that these days because sometimes people think it's bullying and it's it's not right. But but if it's handled correctly, it, it was it just created the atmosphere that yeah. everybody got on well and it was just yeah, it was just fun. It was just fun. Brilliant, brilliant. And um you, you talk about those those early injuries. Did you go on to to have a, a, a senior career? Well, I, I stayed at Middlesbrough till I was about till I was about nineteen and a half, and then Jack, we had that meeting February March where players are then released, you know, and I had that meeting with Jack, and at the time that there was five of us for the midfield position, of which you know Graham was one of them various people there and Jack felt that for first team opportunities, I wouldn't get that. So it would be best to move on. Uh, but he was good enough. Actually at that time, uh, Middlesbrough came here on tour. So they put my, my uh, name around to a few clubs here, but, but I went to Nottingham forest. I went to forest in 75 on a sort of a trial period. I was supposed to be there for a month, but after about a week, I just got a little bit, uh, I, I was still a bit hurt from leaving Middlesbrough, a bit flat, didn't know what I was doing. And I came home after a week and just had a good think about where my, where my future was. And I, I went back to Middlesbrough, spoke to my youth coach, a guy called George Wardle, who was a great mentor at that time. And, and George, we just talked about what the, the possibilities was. And George thought that, getting into physical education, going to university, playing semi-pro, going and getting a qualification, and then maybe, you know, even at 22, 23, still looking at a football career. So that's what I did. I went to Durham University, uh, did a Bachelor of Education degree course, majoring in phys education, played part-time with Scarborough for the first year, Mm -hmm. and then... Uh, while I was finishing off studies, played and captain Durham City in the Northern League uh, and had great times in the Northern League and the Northern Premier League and 
completed my education with with the college or with the university. At that time, as I said, then Middlesbrough came out here, put my name around. A couple of clubs had sent some information. America had got in touch. Uh, I spoke to a couple of clubs in America, but I wanted to finish my education. university course. And uh, I finished that up. And then Darlington was starting off a reserve team and they needed players. So I, I was training with Darlington, playing for their reserves. And then Ringwood City. Ringwood City got in touch with us from here and it just seemed a good idea so the initial plan was that I was going to come out here for six months play for Ringwood City and I'd signed a, a contract also to go and play in Louisiana in America so the plan was six six months in Australia go six months to America and then go back to the UK and maybe look at trying to get back into the football league but I guess looking back I fell in love with Australia fell in love with Melbourne and 43 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So um, from memory, so Ringwood City, that was the that was the the, uh, the the Dutch club, Wilhelmina. Yes, is that, is that correct? yeah. They're, they're just being they're relegated from the state league. So so they brought out about seven players from the UK to try and get them back up. People, mm -hmm. Well, uh, Davy Brooks, who's a bit of a personality around here. Brooks, he was brought out. Uh, uh, Bobby Maltz. Myself, a goalkeeper called uh, Les Fern. So they brought out uh, quite a few people um, and then had three years at Ringwood City. Was that was that a successful time there at Ringwood? Yeah, we, we uh, got back into the uh, State League. Um, Mr. Van Aboken uh, was the owner. Incredible man. He is, I've got so much to, to thank him for. He brought me to Australia. He gave us the opportunities which I've had. Um, he was a bit of a character. He was a bit of a, uh, he wanted to dominate everybody, tell people what to do. But the amount of work he did for football and he's just, as I said, I can't thank him enough. He's, uh, he's unfortunately passed away now. But uh, And then after three years, I, I wanted to get into coaching. I'd started coaching back in the UK when I was at university. I did my first coaching uh, badge in 1977. That was the prelim. Did my full badge in 1978. Uh, and after three years here at Ringwood, I thought I'd like to get into senior coaching. So uh, Mr. Van got offered us the job at Ringwood, but I didn't fancy working with Ringwood and Mr. Van because he'd be the boss and you would have to do what he would have to do. So I then, uh, Springwell City gave us a chance to actually coach. They wouldn't. Ringwood wouldn't uh, release me from my contract, from my playing contract, because they still wanted us to play for Ringwood. But they were happy for us to go and coach at Springvale City, but I couldn't play. And they stuck a ridiculous, I think they they stuck $10,000 on my head, which at that time yeah. was just a ridiculous. Buy a house. Place. Yeah, but the, the uh, two clubs managed to negotiate, and I think they released us for 5000 So I, I went to... Springwell City as player coach in 1981. What what level were they at? What division? We were in the second division, and I guess over the last three, over the next three years, we went from the second division to the state league for the first time ever. So that 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 was a great learning curve. My first sort of senior gig, and I'd done my senior coaching badge here in 1981 to align with the football. Australia's coaching qualifications. Uh, loved it at Springvale City. We had great success. As I said, got into the State League. But as we all know, that you're never a coach till you get sacked. So Correct. Yeah. we got into the State League, but unfortunately struggled. And in, in 85, finally got that phone call saying, thanks very much, but uh, service is no longer required. And then I just started playing Playing locally, uh, played for Waverley City, played for Nutter Wadding, started to coach again at Nutter Wadding. I, I was also managing leisure centres, so that was my focus. I wanted to set up a, a, a career in business and had a great time man managing leisure centres, playing football, coaching football. Uh, Tim White, who was then the director of coaching, Tim was a, a lovely guy. And again, unfortunately, Tim has passed away. Uh, Tim was trying to get me involved in youth development, but I guess I was still keen to coach senior level. Um, 
And then 1989, I got a phone call from Ernie Merrick. Ernie had just taken over at Sunshine George Cross in the National League. Yeah. And needed an assistant coach and and got in touch with us and asked us. We played against each other, so I, I knew Ernie, but not not too well. He was a Dufton. I was at Ringwood City. I, I, I was scoring goals at Ringwood City. He, he And he was kicking me at Dufton, so we had that relationship. And he rang me and just said, do you want to come and work with us at uh, Sunshine George Cross in the, in the National League? So Brilliant. what year was working this? working in a leisure what? centre, but then Bernie and what? I ha- had a couple of years in National League. What, what year was this? 1989. 89. So um, the names in the squad. So are we talking Aussie Latif? Yes, uh, Lawrence uh, Kidner. Lawrence Kidner. Oh, yeah, you're Sean, great. Sean, Sean Parton. Parton, okay. Um, goalkeeper, so, goalkeeper Sean, Sean Keogh. Sean Keogh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. And then we had da- Davy Clarkson. We had the uh, the two Foster brothers, Craig and and his brother. Uh, we had Gary Gary Hassler. Um, we had a lot of young, young players coming yeah, through. Yeah, I think... So Frank that, that, Talia, goalkeeper. Yeah, Frank Talia. So in, so in comparison to the likes of a, a South Melbourne or, you know, like a Sydney Olympic, you know, it's like your budget would have paled into insignificance. You had, oh, to, go yeah. for the, you had to go for the young, talented player. But it was all about the, the young kids. And because we, 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 we both had a good relationship with uh, Ronnie Smith, a lot of the boys from a- AIS came and played. Kevin, Kevin Muscat. Kevin played, he got his debut as a 16-year-old. He used to fly down from, from Canberra, play the game, and then go back to Canberra. So the focus was very much on youth, on young mm. players. It was a very, very young side, uh, but it was great, great uh, two years. Great, to, And at that same time, Tim White was still talking to us about uh, development. So that's when I also started to work with the state teams. Mm-hmm. Some uh, development with the under 13s, under 14s. So it was a busy time managing a leisure centre. Yeah. Time well, working full time with the uh, National League and also doing some some work with the state squads. But it was but it was great because you were working involved, working in football, working with with both senior players and kids. But I guess as time went on, I got more satisfaction working with the kids and developing them. Mm. Mm-hmm. So um, you made an interesting comment and said you're not a, a coach until you've been sacked. How much, uh, especially at the sort of the professional level or the performance phase of, of coaching, it, it seems like winning papers over the cracks and people sort of forget about, forget about the problems that exist and the losses sort of tend to highlight those, those uh, problems. Mm-hmm. So... You know the um, in in your time when you think about you know uh, that performance phase of football, um, what what were some of the things that you tried to um, circumvent um, and and p- paper over those cracks to try and get a win? Well, obviously at senior level, it's about winning. It, it's about winning whether you win well or you win badly. It's mm. about winning, and sometimes. By by winning, it does paper over the cracks. But what what we've really got to look at, and this goes back, one of my mentors, as well as uh, Tim White, was a guy called uh, Tony Dunkley. Tony was the president of the of the federation, Victoria. Tony and I worked when I was at uh, Springvale City as a player coach. When you're on the ground, you, you need somebody that's off the ground who can see things as well. So Tony worked with us for two years. And Tony was a kind of a mentor with us at uh, Springvale City and things which which uh, Tony said and things which I picked up, particularly from uh, Ronnie Smith as well. There's another uh, mentor. And you talk about the process and the outcome. The process is how well did we play and the outcome is did we win? From, from the uh, coaching point, at senior level, it's predominantly about the outcome. It's, mm. it's about winning. From, from a developmental point of view, it's about the process. But if you want to have a world-class senior team, then you've got to look at both. You've got to look at the process because you obviously want the players to play well, you want the fans to enjoy the football, and you want people to talk about how well you are. 
as a team. So you need to work on both the process and the outcome. And that that will change depending on what you, what your role is. If you're a senior coach, you're going to be more on the outcome. If you're a developmental coach, you're more on the process. And you got to change that depending on what your role is at the club. Mm. And the the uh, are you finding from your feedback to let's say coaches that focus on that developmental level, is there an overemphasis on one or the other? If you had to throw a blanket, let's say what's happening in Australian football, do you think there's uh, there's uh, because I, I feel like you know, I'll just work, work back when I was when I was uh, playing, I didn't feel like there was a uh, an emphasis on process. Uh, when, when I was growing up, let's say 13, 14, 15, 16, playing football, it was about the win. We were almost treated like little men. Yeah. Um, whereas the winning is still winning is still very much part <laughs> of, of a developmental program. That, that's what people sometimes winning is all about. Well, games is about you want to win. If you go into a game, we don't go into a game not wanting to win. You've really got to, if you look, look at cut look at kids at any level if you see them playing in the playground playing playing tiggy or or whatever you you're running so hard to try and catch your mate then when you catch them you're trying to get away from them kids are very very competitive kids mm. will, 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 will always want to win little competitions winning is still important but it's not the only thing but you've mm. got to get that balance between you've got to win the right way you've got mm. to win and you've got to look at the process and the outcome. So, so my career, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, has been very much on getting that balance between process and outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and the really successful coaches can achieve both. But at times, at times during a season, you may change that, that shift because we're struggling at the bottom. We need to win, whether we, we've got to win bad or we've got to win ugly mm. so you look at the outcome because we have to win mm. but you can sometimes not coast but you can certain, uh, sometimes change that focus to the process you are uh, you spent a lot of time at the federation um coaching like you, you mentioned uh yep. state state teams um walk us through some of the players that came through in the old decade that you spent there oh um I've kept the record. We've we've had uh, twenty in my time. Twenty three boys went on to play for the Socceroos. Okay. So it's oh, the first you go back. Uh, Vince Grella was just an outstanding kid at, at at thirteen. You just knew Vinny was just special. He was just mm. so special. Um, you've got uh, the uh, Maisano brothers came through. They, John was quality. Daniel Golsop was quality. Uh, Adrian Leyer was quality. Saw Adrian down in Geelong. Uh, we had a weekend camp. Or oh, one thing I started at the at the at the at the federation was country camps. I wanted to get out into the country regions because I knew that there was quality kids playing in country regions. Vince uh, Vince Leyer came from the country area. Uh, Josh. Josh Kennedy, first day that Josh sort of turned up, and I said, "Good day, uh, where are you from?" And he said, "Yet yeah, a uh, yak and dander." I said, "Where, where the hell is that? that? <laughs> Where's yak and dander?" <laughs> so uh, these lads were just just quality. Michael Ferrante was a quality player. Uh, Christian Sarkis was a quality player. Mm. Then goalkeepers, Eugene Glekovic, great great goalkeeper. Um, there was just so many good Simon uh, Klosimo quality, mm. but not only oh Con Con uh, Blatzes was there as mm. well. So there was a a whole host of quality in recent times. Jamie uh, McLaren, uh, Bailey Wright, Jimmy Jago, well, these lads who went on to play for the for the Sotros. Not only good technical players, but just good people. Mm. Kids, kids who didn't just like soccer, they loved it. Mm. You look at Bailey, uh, Bailey, you know, and he won't mind us saying it. Uh, Bailey was not one of the best technical players, but Bailey's leadership skills, Bailey's 
uh, commitment and enthusiasm was just incredible. He did everything right. He was going to be successful no matter what. Great leader and has had a fantastic career. Mm. Um, whereas people like Vinny Grella, v Vinny's ability to just knock 30, 40, 50 meter balls. I remember ringing Ernie Merrick when Ernie and I worked at the VIS and I rang him on the Wednesday night and just said, Ernie, I've just seen a kid. We've got to bring him in. He's 13. Oh, he's too young. Yeah, I know he's too young, but he's just special. He's just a special kid that we need to bring in. So Vinny, where most of our squads were 15, 16, 17-year-olds, we brought in Vinny because he was just, you could just see that he had that special ability and he mm. just wanted to be successful. He wanted to go to the very top. Yeah, brilliant. The... Um... What were some of the sort of, we, we talk about uh, in Australian coaching, the changing of the framework, but what, what kind of framework did you use there as part of your coaching principles in the, in the say, the, either the state teams or later on at the VIS? Well, I guess at, at the state team, when I first started, my, my, my first squad was the under 13s and it, it was just what you knew at that time and you just put into practice I guess things which which you had put into you when you were a young player, but 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 also talking to to, to people like Tim White, Tony Tony Dunkley, um, and then later on now Ronnie Smith. When Ernie and I set up the VIS in 1991, uh, we went to Canberra for a week and we shadowed Ronnie okay. yeah. just to see what their program was like. And and that year the intake that they had included people like Mark. Mark Viduka. So we were there for the week to just shadow, look and see what they were doing, get some ideas and the concept. You can obviously bring that back to Victoria and set up the VIS as a feeder into the Australian Institute of Sport. So yeah. you tend to take bits and pieces from your mentors, from people that you really uh, understand. Plus, I've always kept in touch with, with people back in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I guess now it's a lot easier with Zoom and all that. But but in those days, you, you'd be writing letters and then waiting for two weeks for somebody to write back to you with with a sort of answer or you'd mm -hmm. make a phone call. So I've always had, had the contacts back in the UK as well as developing the contacts here. And then when you go on coaching courses, you know, and you meet on, on one of my first coaching courses here, I remember spending time with Jimmy Rooney and Jimmy was was going through his coaching badges at the end of his playing career. And, you know, fantastic guy, great, great legend. Got the people like Johnny uh, Johnny Gardner, who, who's unfortunately su uh, suffered a stroke and is not in the best of health. Johnny was one of the, one of the greatest football brains here. And yeah. you pick people's brains. Can I guess I'll take it back a little bit. When I was at Sunshine George Cross, I also set up a business with George Best. Okay. Back at, so we actually brought out George Best to do a series of coaching clinics and speaking engagements and just spending weeks with a person like George Best and hearing what George, what George's thoughts were on development and on, on football. And then the next year, we brought out George Best and Dennis Law. And we oh, also wow. met up with Bobby Charlton. So when you mix with, with those sorts of people and you, and you get George running – coaching sessions or training sessions and, and just listening to what he's got to say and what views he had on, on this mm. is what we did. And this is what I think the play should do. You, 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 you build up a, just a, a yeah. 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 And I think it's a matter of taking the bits and pieces from the various coaches, the players, which you work with, you know, and even stuff that Jack Charlton, Jack Charlton, the thing that always stuck in my mind, Jack, Jack made coaching really simple, but Jack was probably the first coach. Stan Anderson wasn't really a coach. He was more of a manager where Jack really came in and started to actually coach us. And Jack talked about the where, when and how back in 1973. Mm. And it was all about where do you play the ball? When do you play it? And how do you play it? Mm. And also where do you run? When do you run? And how do you run? And it was just things like that you pick up from 40 odd years ago that still apply these days. 
that are the foundation, and that gets back to the principles of play. Mm. Then, unfortunately, when when our when the Dutch came in and, in my view, changed our system not for the better, when the Dutch came in, they really disregarded the principles of play and started mm. to talk about uh, patterns of play mm. and about formations. And I think that the principles of play are, are the basis of football uh, development. And we lost it, in my view, for 10 years. We lost it for, from a coaching point of view and we lost it from a playing point of view because we, we stepped away from the principles of play. Mm. And, and you look you look now at, let's say, at, you know, the, that 13 to 17 or 13 to 18 year olds play. Teams tend to play similar. You, you see people with different jerseys on, but that same sort of 4-3-3 playing against a 4-3-3 and a similar type of play, regardless of who you're seeing, there's not a lot of uh, improvisation um, in, in today's football. And I think that that could be down to uh, a generational change because kids don't do organised play. Everything's organised. So you send your kid to training at a club or you send them to an academy or you send them the rarely getting six on six in the park. Well, the best story that I think will, will uh, explain that a very high profile coach. It was a very close friend of mine. I won't mention the name, but, but they were at the, the national titles in Canberra and he's chatting to somebody about this same kind of issue and he actually turned his back on the game that was going on. So it, it was probably New South Wales against Victoria or whatever, under 16 national championships. He turned his back to the game just as they were going to kick off. And he's having a conversation uh, with a guy and he's saying to him, right, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen out there now. Mm -hmm. So he heard the referee's whistle and he said, OK, the number eight, uh, the number nine is going to pass to the number eight. He's going to pass it back to, to the number three, who's going to play it square to the number five, who's going to play it out there, who's going to come back. And this guy who's looking back at this fella saying, how do you know that? What, what, how do you know? He says, because that's how every team has been coached to play. Mm -hmm. Every team is playing that. And another story, which I, I left the uh, Federation in 2010 because I, well, they didn't want me, but I but I just found what we were doing was just totally wrong and we we're heading in the wrong direction. So we we a part of company. I, I had 12 months out of the game. I didn't go to, to, to many games. I was a little bit flat and wasn't happy the way things were going. And then I went to watch a local game. And I went to watch a local game, just the junior game. And a, a referee came over to us who, who I hadn't seen for a while. Because uh, one of the things which I did at the Federation, which I think needs to change back, is when I took over the uh, coaching uh, department, I requested that the referee department came into the coaching department as well. So we then created this, this super uh, department, basically where we work closely with the referees. Can I work closely with Chris, Chris Bambridge? Can I would get Chris to either come in himself or send a referee to, to the coaching courses. And I used to give them one hour to talk and liaise with the coaches. So, so we had coaches and referees working together. And so I knew quite a few of the uh, referees. But anyway, I'm watching this uh, junior game. This uh, referee came over, started chatting. You know, he said, look, I've not seen you around, Ian, for a while. I said, yeah, I said, I've, I've stepped away. I'm just taking a bit of a rest, I'm taking a bit of a break. And we got on chatting. And without me prompting him, he said to me, I don't enjoy referee anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? He said, well, I used to do two, two games at the weekend and I did it for the fitness. I, I did it because I, I wanted to keep fit. You know, it was a great way of keeping fit, of running around. He said, no, he said, I referee and I stand in the centre circle. He said, and what happens is the teams kick off and they pass the ball back and they pass the ball square and they pass the ball back. And he said, so I don't have to run because nobody's knocking any long passes. Nobody's dribbling forward. So he said, now I can do three games at the weekend and I don't raise a sweat. He said, because now the games are so 
false, so slow. And that was what in 2011. So that got me thinking. And that was the, the, the sort of focus for me to set up a coaches association, which I did in 2012, because I just mm -hmm. felt that coaches were not being given the right direction. And there was a lot of stuff that, that the coaching courses weren't applying to people at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I just felt, well, I'm going to set up a coaches association to try to impart certain things which I think are now missing because I ran the coaching scheme for 10 years and I just felt that the, the coaches were and don't don't get me wrong parts of the coaching courses were good and I still encourage people to do their coaching badges but I just felt that there was a loss of focus of how the game should be played mm. so I set up a coaches association 2012 and the funny thing was we were we were going to launch it October 2012, and I've, in recent times I've done some work with uh, West Ham, and they run an international uh, football camp on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. and, and I was up there in 2012 working on that camp with a mate of mine, George uh, Cowie's got the uh, contract yep. for the whole of, of Asia, and we we run these camps, and it's all kosher linked with West Ham. It's one of the best ones around. And I'm up on the Gold Coast and I, I get a phone call. I get a phone call from Football Australia. I get a phone call to ask me not to form a coaches association. Mm. And I couldn't believe that they would do that. And they didn't want us to sort of bag the federation and bag. And I said to them, I'm not doing it to bag the federation. I said, why would I bag a federation I've worked 20 years for? Mm. And something which I'm very proud of. I said, I'm not going to bag the federation. And I used to tell people that join the coaches association, don't come on board and be negative and talk about what's not, what's not happening and what are the federation not doing. Come on board because you want to be a positive coach and learn. And mm -hmm. I said to them, we're not going to bag the federation, but what we're going to do is we're going to put sessions on that we think coaches need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And I, I just found that, strange for the national body to feel uh, it's about power isn't it it's yeah. about yeah it's about yeah. it's about power do you think there's a bit of a in do you think there's a bit of a counterculture happening so there's a the, the clock is turning or the wheels are turning a little bit we're, we're going back to um maybe penetration over possession um Very much so yeah i i did a session which was just based on that the coaches came in and I drew a big P on the whiteboard, a big P. And we just started the, the, uh, the talk saying, look, in the last couple of years, we've been talking about possession, 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 possession. I'm going to change that word now to penetration. Mm. We need to start talking about, and having people like uh, Ronnie Smith back in, back in a role, Trevor Morgan, and now with Ernie, with his new appointment, the principles of play are coming back into mm. language. The, the principles of play, and, and I would like to think that the AFCAD group and now Football Coaches Australia have actually led to a bit of a change of, of yeah, view personnel. and that we are yeah. now heading back to where it should never have left, the principles mm. of play. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about, um, I think, Ron Smith in his analysis of how goals are scored, you know, it's like yeah. uh, most goals, you know, uh, well under you know, a, a few passes and under, you know, five passes uh, or less. Yeah. Five passes or less. And, and, you know, uh, so many seconds after winning the ball, which suggests that the early balls played forward uh, sometimes over the top or through the middle uh, penetration, multiple, multiple lines of the fence and, and score. Um, yeah. So that, that idea, the other thing too is I, I um, you know, having a, a team, with uh, multiple possession, but when it's played sideways and backwards, it's almost boring. You go and watch the highest level of football played and the team's keeping possession, but they, they're kicking the ball in their halfway line while the other team's sitting back on their 18-yard box. Yeah. It, tends to be, it tends to be fairly unattractive for me. I want to I see both teams moving forward and backwards. Well, that's why we, we really started with our sessions to actually start to, to do more sessions on the principles of play 
on penetration, on looking at can you play the ball forward on your first touch or can you move the ball forward on your first touch. There is no doubt that that when a team can can make 15 or 16 passes and score a goal, sometimes it, it's magic. It, yeah, it's beautiful. It looks really yeah. good. But but what, what coaches need to be told on, on coaching courses, and this is where I, I had the big fallout with the Dutch and uh, with our technical direct... Again, to actually go back to 2000 and, 2006 or seven, we we had the Institute Challenge. In 2006, the Institute Challenge was held in Queensland and the VIS won it. We beat Queensland in the final, I think it was, 1-0. And the then uh, technical uh, director was a guy called uh, Robert Barn, who was only here for about a year and a half and he came to just start to change the whole culture. And Robert gave the uh, presentations at the end of the uh, week of competition. And we won it, uh, VIS won it. And Robert's speech went something like, or he's, he, he said something about, it was very pleasing to see teams attempting to play out from the back. That was his comment. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I went up to him, shook, uh, shook his hand, thanked him for, for, for coming, you know. And I said, by the way, yeah, Robert, I just want to say something about what you just said. And he said, what? I said, Robert, we've been attempting to play out from the back for the last 20 years. I said, but what we don't do is we don't insist that they have to play out from the back. So all I said to him, the Dutch came in and thought, you know, and again, I'll be controversial here. They thought that we knew nothing about football. We mm. had a group. Gus Hitting did an incredible job with us to get to the World Cup in 2006. Incredible job. But suddenly... The people in FFA at that time thought that the Dutch was the way to go. So we brought in all of these Dutch people who thought that that we knew nothing about football and that they were going to teach us how to play football and there was only one way to play. We were all told that we all had to go to the Australian Institute of Sport and do the five-day course of the youth Dutch coaching scheme. We all had to do it to keep our jobs in the Institute program. So we all went there. And it was great to catch up. Everybody was there. And at, at morning tea on the second day, we as a group, all the, the, uh, uh, the yeah, yeah, we all started to chat and say, this is a waste of time. They're, they're telling us what we've been doing for the last 20 years. They're telling us we've done this. We've, we've done this. And I was kind of voted as the spokesperson because they said, somebody's got to say something. So I went and had a word. And to be fair, the two guys who, who came and, and did the course, they were really good guys, but they'd only been told what to do. And I had a quick chat to them, and then we got everybody together and talked. And they then heard what we said, and they changed the, the actual program. And it was a great course. It was a fantastic course. But they were only here to do the course, and then they went back home. The people who stayed here still had the view that they knew everything and we knew nothing. Mm. And they changed a lot of our systems. They changed a lot of the structures. And it's certainly not sour grapes, but I just think we've gone backwards in yep. 10 years. We so, I mean, so, yeah, in, if, you, if, you, if you take maybe, let's say, elite performance and what's happened, uh, it's gone backwards. But there's a couple, couple of things that I think that we've improved on. A, um, if, I, if I look back on the quality of the coaching um, yep. that it has put on in grass. So what, what's improved? Girls' participation, infinitely better. Absolutely. Uh, numbers, infinitely better. Quality of coaching sessions, infinitely better. Um, what have we lost, maybe? Um, individual freedom, That's I think that's dissipated. Um, the, you know, the you know, allowing creative players to do whatever that X factor was. Um, I think coaches uh, in the last decade have sort of tried to quell that down and get people to play this uniform vanilla football, which um, is a little bit sort of bland. Um, and it's really the X factor players that end up making it, right? 
there are a lot of good coaches coming through. There are a lot of good coaches, but there are a lot of coaches who are putting on sessions, but they can't coach within that, that session. That, that, uh, that's an issue. They can do a really good PowerPoint presentation, set up a coaching drill, set up a coaching practice, but you, you need to coach within that practice what's going on. So mm. that's one thing. Two, the actual structure which, which we have, the Institute programs, ran for 18 years the institute program can i've just had actually coffee with a guy with aaron healy who was mm -hmm. our first captain at the vis mm -hmm. in 1991 and aaron was just talking about his experience the joeys have just been beaten 3-2 by yeah. minimum yeah. okay ridiculous now, ridiculous but the problem is and i'm not going to bag the coach it's the 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 system that's led to the players. All the institute programs always did tours. We used to go away to yeah. Europe, South America, and talking uh, with Aaron, he was telling us what his preparation was before they played the World Cup qualifiers in those days. They were already experienced travelers at overseas tournaments. They'd been to Europe. They'd been to South America. They'd been all over the place even before they'd gone to the qualifiers. Mm. Now, we've got a bunch of lads now who've gone to Indonesia, and I'm sure some of them would have never traveled overseas before, mm. let alone been in a tournament. The institute programs that we used to have actually got the experience into the young kids at such an early age that when they went into the national camps to prepare for the work of qualifiers, they were seasoned international players. Mm. What we've got now with our system is we have an academy program where the kids are training with the same age groups. They're doing an awful lot of training. They're not being challenged because they're playing with, with kids of their own age. That They're not experiencing the international travel. They're not experiencing the international competition. In 2007, the uh, VIS, uh, we went over to, to, to the UK, played six games against Premier League academy teams. Mm. And again, Bailey Wright, Jimmy Jago, uh, these guys, wealth of experience. 2009, mm. we took a squad to the Montague Cup, which is one of the biggest European youth tournaments. And we went as the Institute, because our national body, because our Dutch masters at the time, decided not to take our national team to it. So I put my hand up and said, could we go instead of the Joeys as a state institute program? So at the time, it sounded like a great idea, which it was. But the first match, we're standing in the tunnel. We're about to play the French national team. This is the VIS international team. I'm standing at the back of the team with uh, Harry Bingham. And I looked across at the French guys who were all six foot two, six foot three, dark skinned. Pogba was there. He, he was playing there. The VIS is standing next door to them in the tunnel, five foot six, five foot seven, white as anything, standing there. I looked at Harry and I said to him, it, it was a good idea at the time, Harry. We went out there. We played the French national team. We scored first. We're one nil up against the French national team. They, they then batted us five one. Mm. We then played Germany the German national team. We got battered 5-0. We then played Mali. We managed to draw with them two each. We then played the UAE and we beat them 2-1 when we were an institute program. Jamie McLaren was in that team. Mm. These kids got the experience of playing in those tournaments. New South Wales did exactly the same. ACT did the same. South Australia, Western Australia. Before they even went to World Cup qualifiers, our best youth players were seasoned international mm. players. We don't have that now. So you can't yeah, yeah. blame the coach in Indonesia. You have to look at the system yeah. and we have to change the system of the preparation of our young players. So that, that, that's one thing that we need to do, I suppose, that, that, that the elite development phase. So obviously, so uh, more tournaments, which would probably lead to better selection because players might play well domestically, but put them on a plane, foreign land, foreign food, hmm. home away from home, 
you know, you, you get a different player. And it's about resilience, mental capacity, Absolutely. emotional stability. All these other things aren't tested when they're playing 30 minutes away from home. Yeah. Um, so what, are, what I mean, we're getting into what we need to improve. Uh, from from your point perspective, what are some of the other things that you think we need? Well, again, looking back at at, at the uh, state squads and the, and the VIS, the kids did, didn't have to be pay didn't have to pay to be part of the program. We've got kids who are having to pay two thousand dollars to be in a developmental program. Does that mean that you've got the best players who are in the squad or does that mean we've got only the players whose parents can afford the $2,000? Mm. We've got we've got a system, you know, uh, how many of the Minimar kids would have would be paying $2,000 to be part of their developmental program? Yeah, we've got a system whereby we are only looking at a certain group of people. When I was with the uh, state state federation, I had a, a very good relationship with the board, but I had one major disagreement at one stage that when we went to the Super Leagues, the uh, junior Super Leagues back in, was it 95, 96? The board told me that I could only pick state players from the Super League. And I said, no, you, you can't do that. No, oh, no, we're trying to build up the Super League. So we want all the best players to come into the Super League and play so we need to make sure that you can't be picked for a state team unless you're in the super league can i say to them no i'm sending out coaches to go and look in the a leagues and the b leagues because there's players there who are either playing there because their dad's coaching they're either playing there because they want to stay with their mates they're either playing there because they don't want to go to another club they're quite happy to stay at at their club Mm. and what we've got here is a system where you're forcing kids to trial in the NPL. We're saying that we've got the best kids playing in the NPL, but we've got a system that's setting the kids up to fail. Mm. Because every year, the NPL clubs are forced to have trials. Now, 50 or I've got kids coming to school who come to school on the Monday and they are shattered. They are absolutely flat. Why are you feeling uh, like that? Oh, I've been trialing at such and such a club and I haven't got in. Well, the problem is 50 or 60 kids have turned up at, say, Bentley Greens or South Melbourne to trial where they've only got two or three spots. So, so many kids, the system is set up for kids to fail. Mm. The clubs are being forced to run trials where surely they shouldn't be forced to run trials. But Mm. also... There are good kids playing in community clubs. There are quality kids. And that was why I set up the I set up the uh, primary school state teams back in 1996. We did not have a primary school state team. But I set that up with, with the Primary School Sports Association because I wanted to create a pathway for every kid in Victoria to be able to get to a state team and mm. play. I then set up the, the country squads in 1998 because we used to have just one Victorian team and it was dominated by Metro kids because they were playing in a strong competition, but there was quality kids in country regions. So then I set up a country squad team. So we then had double the Victorian kids, 16 kids from country Victoria, 16 kids from Metro Victoria actually went to national. We've got to broaden our base of selection. And I think what we've got is an NPL system that is flawed because we're just keeping it to a restricted number. Yeah. And we're forcing kids to pay two and a half thousand or parents to pay huge amounts of money. It's interesting you say that. So now the two A-League clubs in Victoria don't charge for their players. But if you think about who are they selecting, they're selecting what, what ends up happening in, let's say Melbourne City and, and Melbourne Victory, they've got their squad. And right now, both of those teams are, are looking at their weakest six players. But who are they selecting? They're selecting opponents that they play against mm. and who have done damage against them. And those kids are paying $2,300 to play for the, the opposition team, right? Um, so, and you've probably got kids in the, the uh, community program. We're paying three, four, five, six hundred dollars in a community side 
um, because that's what they can afford. Interesting point. So um, I mentioned I, I put something into the to the federation a couple of years ago. I've been on the yeah, coaches standing committee for the last seven years, and um, but I put a plan in that we should have an NPL representative team and we should have a community representative team. So kids in the community can still be selected for a community, can even set it up north, south, east and west of Melbourne, set up four regional. It's like where we had the regionals. Like when, well, that's when, right. Yeah, we, so that's, that's how they you were great. Pick the, the state side. You have your regionals, you make your yep. regionals. And then after that, you make the state side, get your Buffalo bag. Um, that's right. Yes. No, yeah. Normally thrown at you in the changing room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the, so the interesting uh, point about the, you know, how we, how we're doing that versus the, the TIDC uh, current setup. So similar concept, but I mean, how players come in and out of that, that, that program are, are the Absolutely. best kids. Absolutely. Getting... If we can set up a, a, a community program to look at the elite players within the uh, community, north, south, and east and west, bring them bring them together and then take them on a mini tour, take them up to the Australian in Institute of Sport, put them there for a week, play local teams, give them some incentive that, that they're still going to be looked at in the community, yet they don't have to be forced to go for trials. Can I've got kids at school who actually in one week can go to three trials at three different clubs and they get disappointed three times. So I, I just think I don't have the answers. What, what I see are the problems we need to look at, stop putting kids into situations that are going to cause them pain, that they are, mm. they are setting up kids to fail. Mm. If 50 mm. or 60 kids turn up for three spots you're going to get kids who are going to be disillusioned with the game. Mm. And we can't do that. If something is there that's either stopping a child uh, developing or stopping a child loving to continue to play the game, then we have to change that rule or change that uh, situation. Have to. It's great words of advice. So, so now, uh, Ian, you, you're speaking and, and you do uh, with your role at, at Roeville Sports Academy. You've been there for many, many years. So what are you saying to that, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old boy or girl that wants to take their football to the next level? What, what, are, what, are, what are the overarching principles or messages that you, you're giving to them? We work a lot on uh, technique at that Rollville, even though in recent weeks, this year in particular, we've had a, a lot of success with, with teams. We're not team structured. We're about the individual uh, development because all the kids then go off and play for their club sides, NPL or the uh, community. So we're about the individual uh, development. So what, what we're about is working on their technique, working on things that they may not get chance to at club level because the clubs are, are getting their teams ready to play the games at weekends. And maybe some of the coaches are more focused on the winning rather than on the uh, development. So we do an awful lot of individual work on technique, but, but the more, that I work with kids, particularly at the moment, the more it's about their attitude, about their mental side, about them wanting to be the best they can possibly be. Words of wisdom that were given to me many, many years ago. I'm not coaching football. I'm coaching the person. I want the person to be successful both on the ground and off the ground. So you're looking at the attitude, the attitude about uh, respect, uh, respect to your teammates, respect to yourself, respect to the program, respect to the coach, respect to the opponents that, that you're playing against. I think more so it's about dealing with the attitude. And the best quote, Bill Bill Beswick's probably one of the best sports psychologists. He worked, I, I first met him at Middlesbrough because he was the assistant manager. Uh, Steve, Steve McLaren had got him working with him at Manchester United. He also took him to the England team. He's one of the best sports psychologists around. And Bill, Bill Beswick's got the quote that performance follows attitude. And that's something which I've had printed, I've given to kids, I've put on the walls. Performance follows attitude. Not just on the park, but when they're in the classroom, 
when they're with their mums and dads, when they're with, with their mates. Performance follows attitude. If you can get that instilled in the kids, and it's also telling them that we're not about trying to make them a professional footballer. With our job at school, I think at the moment it's one, keeping them in love with the game, two, keeping them engaged, and three, whatever level that they're going to play at, if they're going to go and kick a ball on the weekend for whatever team, surely you want to have fun. Yes, you were with your mates, but surely you want to be the best you can possibly be at that level. So we're trying to say at whatever level, community level five or NPL one or whatever, we want them to be coming off the ground that they've, they've done the best, they've been the best they possibly can be. And where that takes them, will depend on op the opportunities that are presented to them. But in my job at the moment, all I'm trying to do is keep them engaged, keep them in love with the game and try to be the best they can possibly be at whatever level. Fantastic words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Ian, for your continued contribution to Australian football. Um, we wish you all the very best and today's been really insightful. No, thanks for the opportunity. Any time to talk football. Hey guys, we've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button and have a fantastic day. Well, I'll uh, talk for hours. Have a good day. All right, cheers. Thanks, Sasha.